couple weeks ago, Parker, after a Sunday service, shared something with me, and it uh, really ministered to me, and uh, it actually is where we're going today. Okay, so we were praying at church once a couple weeks ago, and then when I was praying at the altar, I was praying, and I said, we need a Bible, like we need to breathe, and then so I was just praying, and then I just decided to hold my breath as long as I could, and I like was going for a super long time, and I was about to uh, start breathe, start like releasing the air again, where I could breathe, and then right when I was about to stop, uh, well, he left, but Papa, he put his hand right when I was about to stop on my back, start at that praying. exact moment, started praying for me. He's talking about desperation. Now I'm going to have us do this. Parker said we need revival like we need air. That's a pretty good description, right? Can everybody hold your breath? Let's see who, wait, we're going to see who can do it the longest. We're going to talk about holy desperation. And I thought Parker's illustration was a good example of that. Um, desperation is a catalyst. Nothing significant happens or changes unless people are dissatisfied and they're desperate with their current situation. That's how things change. Uh, long term. Without a holy desperation, what happens is we live our spiritual lives on cruise control. We just kind of end up coasting. Um, holy desperation in the hearts of God's people is evident. When, God, when that begins to happen in a group of people, um, in a nation or in, a, in a, just a collection of people corporately, holy desperate, desperation in the hearts of God's people is evidence that God has a desire to revive His people. Um, last couple times I've had an opportunity just to share from the Word. First time we uh, went to Jeremiah 33.3. 3. Jeremiah 33.3 3 says, call to me. God says, call to me. And that word um, I shared that day is the same word that's used like when a raven is crying out desperately in need of food. Um, so it's a desperate cry to God. Call unto me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. And then a couple weeks after that, we looked at Isaiah 64, 1. And it was another desperate cry from Isaiah. And it was, oh, oh, that you would rend the heavens. Oh, God, I've got to have you do this. I've got to have you show up. I've got to have you manifest yourself in this situation. That you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains would tremble before you. As, a, as I'm looking through Scripture and studying this topic, two things have, have been shown to me by the Lord recently. And the first is this, that God always responds to the desperate and the hungry. I'm telling you, you go from Genesis, and you look all the way through there, um, story after story, you go to, clear through the, Old, the New Testament, and there are desperate people, there are hungry people, and when they cry out to God, God responds. Historically, as a church, we're seeking revival. Now, historically, revival is birthed out of desperation out of grief, out of anguish and brokenness. So that's the first thing. God responds to the desperate and hungry. And the second thing is this that I've noticed, is that people, when you look in, in just in our world or you look in Scripture, people who are desperate, when they are desperate, they move beyond convenience. They move beyond personal comfort and, and the norm. If I, am, if I was truly desperately hungry, I would eat out of a dumpster. I have... Fortunately, never had to do that. But if I was desperate, that would be out of the norm, right? Um, now, when I am desperate for a revival or, or something spiritually, the same thing kind of kind of falls into places. I do things. I'm willing to, to go to, to lengths that I may not have typically gone to to see the Lord move in my family, in my life, in my church, in my country, whatever it may be. Now, with those two things in mind, I want us to look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we see in this, this is really a fantastic Mother's Day passage, uh, but in it there's a desperate prayer. And when a desperate, when a deep, desperate cry pours out from the heart of God's people, what is the Lord's response? Well, I believe that that is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And so I want you to turn there if you haven't gotten there already, and we're just going to read it. We'll see how far we go, but we'll uh, start with verse 1. And I'm reading out of the NIV. And I don't know if I can get all the names correctly, so we'll try. There was a certain man from Ramathayim, sounds good, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite, 
I think we're done with those. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this, went, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrificed to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and she wouldn't eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the chair in the doorpost, by the doorpost by the, of the house of the Lord. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. And let's stop there. <coughs> Hannah. She's one of two wives of this guy named Elkanah. And this, she comes from a God-fearing family. Okay? There was a faithfulness to the house of the Lord we read about. She was loved very much by her husband. In fact, the second wife was probably a wife of convenience, simply to have children, to expand the, the family in those days. Um, so she was loved by her husband. But she was defined most by what she lacked. See, Hannah was barren. And she couldn't have kids of her own. And uh, she desperately wanted them. A barren woman was considered a failure in that day. It was acceptable grounds for divorce in the society that she lived in, which really shows you the love that her husband had for her to keep her there and to, and to, to love her. Um, but barrenness, the inability to have children was a social embarrassment. Her brokenness labeled her and her barrenness labeled her as worthless in that society. Hannah's barrenness made her the target of verbal abuse. We read about that. The other wife, Peninnah, she was a bully if there ever was one. She was provoking, she was mocking. And Hannah was relentlessly taunted to the point that it drove her to tears and she lost her appetite. And just a side note on this, uh, the lady Panina, she was defining a person's self-worth by the size of their crop or their, their fruitfulness. But that's not how God defines your self-worth. You see, she was making a good thing the thing. And that's idolatry. That's what we talked about last week. But here's the zinger in this story. Hannah wasn't barren by choice. Did you get that when we read that? Hannah, it wasn't a choice of hers to be barren. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say and suggest that her barrenness wasn't for a lack of trying. They were a married couple. We're told that the Lord had closed her womb. You see, part of God's plan for Hannah involved postponing her years of childbearing. I would imagine that if she knew the verse, she probably had quoted Jeremiah 29, 11, pretty much daily, regularly, but she couldn't see the promised hope. She couldn't see the future. She still loved God, and she believed that verse, but she couldn't see it. 
Hannah was struggling with God's timing in her life. Have we been there? Maybe you're there today. Struggling with God's timing. You don't understand. So Hannah was barren. If something is barren, it's unproductive. It's depleted. It's parched. It's fruitless. She was not seeing the results that she'd hoped for, right? Her efforts continually, she, she had tried, tried, she wanted to have a child, she wanted to be fruitful, but her efforts continually proved unproductive and fruitless. And without a doubt, this lady had wrestled with her self-worth as a woman. Her heart was broken, she had to have been frustrated, she had to have felt shamed, she had to have been discouraged. She uses the word in her own prayer, misery, to describe her situation. She's feeling helpless. She's hopeless. She is a broken, desperate, hurting, but a determined woman. Now, when we talk about desperation, there are different levels and degrees of desperation. If I say, in fact, I made a comment like this last night at Chick-fil-A sitting next to John Blair as he was having a peppermint um, shake. Um, but if I say this, if I say I'm desperate, I very well may be talking about a milkshake. Man, I am desperate for a milkshake. If someone in Bangladesh says that I am desperate, they're probably not referring to a milkshake, right? Um, to accurately define desperation, it means this. You have an urgent need and a very urgent desire. What you are facing is intolerable. You have no hope. You're at the end of your rope. <coughs> You've done all you know to do. You've tried everything you know to try. You've prayed every prayer you could think of to pray. And nothing has changed. And you're out of time. You're out of time. You can't go on living without the change that you desire taking place. That's desperation. There is a desperation that leads a person to rely on something other than themselves. Uh, maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a coworker. You don't understand something. You're at the end of your rope and under, or a tradesperson. You can't do what needs to be done. And so you depend on someone else. But then there's a desperation that's entirely different. There is a desperation that leads a person to utter dependence upon God Almighty and nobody else. A couple summers ago, Parker and, and Taylor and Bailey and Jennifer and Jennifer's dad were climbing a mountain in California, way up on a mountain. And they started down this, this mountain with all these rocks. And Parker takes off running down this mountain. These big old rocks. It's not a smart idea, right? He learned his lesson. But he all of a sudden, he took a fall and began to take a fall that quite literally um, could have taken his life on the side of the mountain. Um, and all Jennifer could do was yell out, Jesus. She was desperate. There was nothing she, there was nothing she could do but turn to God. She couldn't help him. He couldn't help himself. But she, she had the wherewithal to call out to, the, to God Almighty and to yell the name of Jesus. And the Lord ministered. But it was a desperate point. And, and, and we all get there at times. Hannah's desperation, her brokenness, led her to lay it all before God. In verse 10, Hannah's desperation drives her to do something that is out of the ordinary for a woman and probably out of her comfort zone. Because in that, in that verse, in verse 10, we see that Hannah has finally had enough. And the word says she stood up. She got up from the table, from wherever they were eating. She heads for the temples. And she said, enough of this. And she starts to pray. Now there is no doubt in my mind, knowing the family that she came from and what we know from it, there is no doubt that Hannah had prayed before. There's no question in my mind she had prayed about this very issue Many times she brought it before God. But something this day was different. You see, there was a different intensity. There was an urgency, a determination. Her barrenness generated within her a righteous dissatisfaction with the way things were in her life. And she was saying enough was enough. You see, this time, like Jacob, when he wrestled with God at Bethel, this time Hannah wasn't going to be refused. This prayer was different. Now then, when it comes to prayer, how many have discovered this? It is hard to pray with faith. 
when we feel ineffective. It's hard to pray with faith when you feel worthless. It's hard to pray with faith when you're discouraged, when you're beaten down, and when you've prayed and prayed and prayed about that issue and nothing's happened. It's hard to pray with faith sometimes. But here's the good news regarding prayer. You see, God always responds to prayer. He, pr he responds to prayers that are birthed out of faith as well as prayers that are birthed out of desperation. You see, even choosing to turn to God is in and of itself a step of faith. And that's what Hannah does. In her deep anguish, Hannah prays and calls out to the Lord. The Word says that she wept bitterly. She wasn't just praying in some little tears. This wasn't a, a rehearsed prayer that she'd done. God is great. God is good. I was thinking for it. Lord, we're thinking. It, it was coming from her gut. She bitterly wept before God. And the Word says that she poured out her soul. And in verse 11, she says this, Remember me. You don't pray that prayer unless you feel forgotten. That's a prayer you pray when you're, you feel forgotten or abandoned. In fact, she says, Don't forget me. God, don't forget me. God, I've got to have you today. Lord, remember me. Here I am. Here I am. Lord, don't forget me. I'm desperate. And in verse 15, she says, God, I'm deeply troubled. God, I can't go on like this is her prayer. God, I have been praying this for so long. I've got to have an answer. There's nothing I can do to fix this situation. I'm unsatisfied with where I'm at. I've got to have an answer. I'm in turmoil. I'm hurt. My anguish is deep. God, I'm tired of being fruitless. That's her prayer. I'm tired of the heartache of unfulfilled dreams. I'm tired of all these promises that I've been waiting on. I believe you for. And I'm tired of it. I've got to see you come through. Hannah's desperation eventually reaches a point where she can't even use words anymore. You ever been there? You're so overwhelmed. You've prayed every prayer you know to pray so many times. You don't even know what to pray anymore. And you've got nothing left to say but to cry out to God. Romans 8.26 says that in those moments, it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. It says we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes, intercedes for us through wordless groans. And that's exactly what Hannah was doing. That's where desperation had taken Hannah. An impossibility. And, and here she was, she was hopeless. That's where desperation had taken her. And possibly where it's taking you this morning. You see, each of us may experience times of barrenness in our life. It may not be the same thing as what Hannah experienced. But it's those times when nothing comes to birth despite every effort that you've made. That's barrenness. Nothing comes to birth and then, despite all the efforts you make in your work, in your school, in your family in our relationships, in your spirit. You see, let me ask you this morning. You're here for a reason. God knew you'd be here. There's no question about it. He knows all things. But let me ask you, where are you bearing this morning? Where are you bearing this morning? How desperate are you? How desperate are you? When's the last time you shed a, a, a bucket full of tears and cried out, poured out your heart to God at an altar like Hannah did. How desperate are you? What are you prepared to do with the blessings that you're asking for? You see, Hannah surrendered what she asked for to God for His glory. Will we? Hannah could have despaired. She could have given up hope. But instead, she correctly assumes... That an all-powerful God is also an all-compassionate God. You see, she cries out in her agony to God, and God hears her. God hears her weeping. And she gets up, the Word says, and she left that altar that day. And she had, she had held nothing back. She let it all out. She got up and she left the problem with God. And the miracle had already taken place because the Word says she got up and she started eating again. Something had changed. Her face gave it away. Her desperate anguish in prayer had moved the hand of God that day. Desperate, soul-stirring prayers that are birthed out of anguish. Prayers like hers 
result in answers. When God is sought in desperation, He responds. It's His pattern. It's His track record. You see, God had a plan. This is what's even, even neater than that. God had a plan in Hannah's bitter, barrenness. Even in her barrenness, there was a plan that God was working. And He does in ours as well. Romans 8.28 says this, We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. You think a little about little baby Owen. God has a purpose. I don't get it. I don't understand. But there is some reason that that little baby, someday in his life, that's going to become a, uh, something in his life where he's going to know, man, this is why I went through this, to bless someone else or to experience this or whatever it may be. Could it be that God could use your barrenness, your brokenness, to create a brokenness, to create a hunger, to create a desperation that causes your prayers and causes you to pray prayers that usher in a revival that we need. You see, that's what happened in Hannah's case. So why not ours? Why not ours? Because here's the bigger picture. Here's, I've never seen this before in all my times of reading this story, but here's the bigger picture. The physical condition of Hannah what was she? She was barren, right? She was fruitless. The physical condition of Hannah was the spiritual condition of God's people, the nation of Israel at that very time. They were barren. They were fruitless. You read the Word of God. They had a form of godliness. They were very religious. They had all the routine, but there wasn't any life. There was no power. Time-wise, when you turn to the book of Samuel, in fact, the, in the Jewish, the Hebrew Bible, 1st and 2nd Samuel is one book. But when you, when you look at the book of 1st Samuel, time-wise, it comes right on the heels of the book of Judges. So you got Judges, Ruth, 1st Samuel. But it comes right on the heels, time-wise, Judges ends, and you go straight to 1st Samuel. Okay? The last verse of the book of Judges paints a huge picture of what it was to like to live in Israel when Hannah prayed this prayer. The very last verse of Judges, Judges 21-25, says this. It says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So Hannah lived in a day in which allegiance to God was rare. Most people seem to have forgotten him altogether. She lived in a day where idolatry and immorality was rampant. Sound familiar? She lived in a day where individualism, rejection of authority, the matter of anything being right or wrong was a matter of personal opinion. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Yet there wasn't any anguish. No one seemed to care. Even the religious leaders had lost their passion. The sons of, of Eli and Eli himself... Even the religious leaders had watered down the message and they had adjusted their lifestyle to fit into the culture that they lived in. You think about it. Eli the priest, the, high, the, the most important spiritual leader in that nation, Eli couldn't even recognize a broken, hungry spirit when it was set right in front of him. He thought she was drunk. He had no concept and ability. He, he, it was so foreign to him. He couldn't even recognize it. But I'm here to tell you all hope was in God. You see, God still had a plan. Hannah has a son, right? Named Samuel. And God uses Samuel to bring revival to his people. You see, Israel's turnaround, the revival that came to Israel, began with a lonely, broken, hungry woman. That's where revival was birthed. Who just wanted, all her prayer was, she got to the point where her only prayer was, God, I just want to bear fruit. I just want to bear fruit. Did you know what the goal of man is to bring God glory, right? Jesus tells us how to bring God glory. John 15, 8 says, My Father is glorified by this. Here's how you glorify God. That you bear much fruit. So where's the fruit? Remember that commercial, where's the beef? Where's the fruit? You see, I like this about Hannah. Hannah never denied her barrenness. She could have played it off. Eh, 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 kids aren't that important. It's no big deal. You know, she could have. She could have just kind of 
But no, she, she wanted to be fruitful. She didn't deny it. She, I'm barren. And I don't think we can afford to either. Where's the fruit in our country? But she also refused to accept it. Amen? She wasn't done to just accept it and keep going the way things were. And we must as well. You see, we can't save ourselves. We can't. We're in a desperate position. I don't know if you... I mean, I think we all know this. In our country, we're in a desperate spiritual place. And we don't, we can't save ourselves. We can't turn things around in this country by a vote or in our own power. We need God. That's what we need. We can't expand His kingdom in our own strength. We can't rely on techniques, human ingenuity, marketing strategies. I like all those things. Or just some new idea. Because here's what happens. It won't happen by might. God told us. It won't happen by, by our own power. We desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You see, revivals have never come. You go through history, I promise you. Revivals have never come as a result of people getting smarter or gaining greater technology. Never. The, the New Testament church didn't have a lot of that. Revival, every historically you look at it, revival comes as a sovereign move of God in response to the desperate prayers of people just like you and me. Sometimes just one. One lady who just wants to be fruitful. And that's all it took to turn the nation of Israel around. So let me ask you, how desperate are we? How desperate are we? And here's some questions I had to ask myself and I, I just want to put them to you this morning. Can you stand the thought? Can you stand the thought of a lifetime of the spiritually routine? Can, can, you stand, can you stand the thought of living into your 80s and 90s? Getting in that building, seeing a little bit of growth, some families coming through, your kids enjoying the youth pastors need, you know, um, you know, have some families come once in a while, and, and you get older, it's been nice. And can you stand the thought of just the status quo? Can you stand the thought of going through the routine, a lifetime spiritually? Can you stand the thought of not seeing your neighbor saved? Can you lay your head on the pillow, and are you all right if your neighbor goes to hell? Can you stand the thought? Can you stand the thought of not knowing the reality? of His manifest presence and glory? Can you stand the thought of, of not seeing the miraculous? Can you stand the thought of, of going to church the rest of your life and not seeing the kinds of things that you read about in the New Testament? I can't. i got to see it. In desperation, out of an anguishing heart, Hannah cried out to God. And here's what she cried out. I refuse to accept where I'm at. I refuse. I could keep on going. I'd be all right. I'd make it. But I refuse to accept this. I must bear fruit. And God used her anguish and her craving to be fruitful to change the entire history of her nation and God's people. May He do the same with us. Amen.